Welcome to the eighth In Guardians webinar for 2019. Uh, today uh, we have uh, with us uh, our CTO, uh, Jay Beal. Uh, he is our resident cloud guru, uh, and he's going to be talking about uh, attacking and defending uh, Linux. Uh, this is episode nine, uh, based on sneakers. Jay, take it away. Thanks a lot, Mike. Happy to be here. Well, okay, cool. So let's get right into it. Um, I have uh, we're gonna we're gonna do an attack and defense on uh, sneakers uh, on a sneakers uh, capture the flag virtual machine. Here's my bio slide. Of course, bios are big C's of text. So here's what I think of as my real bio slide, my graphical bio. All of these things uh, that you see pictured are are things that I've uh, contributed to or are near and dear to my heart. Uh, what we're gonna do today. I'm going to attack a, uh, a capture the flag virtual machine, and this one's one a, a machine I created um, themed on sneakers, and we'll do that as a demo, and then we'll talk over the attack path, and we'll get into, and then we'll do another demo where I'll show you um, at one of the ways that we can break that attack path, and then we'll talk about other defenses. Um, I love this. I love this theme because in my heart, I started as a uh, I started as a defender. Um, but the bulk of the work uh, that I've done at Guardians over the years has been um, has been on attack, a lot of attack and defense here. But it's just a tremendous amount of the work we've done has been attack focused, and so it's really fun for me to say, wait a second, let me let me uh, let me do an attack. But then how would I have broken that? It wouldn't have been too hard to break it, and and not just perfect knowledge, but but proactively. So there are things you could do to proactively break the attack is basically by having a stronger defense or a stronger configuration in the first place. So we're gonna kind of basically go back in time and um, when we do our defense, and I'll show you, we'll, make, we'll set up the defense and then we'll see that breaking the attack and then we'll talk about the defense so we can do. So um, without further ado, um, we're about to get into the uh, into the uh, pre-recorded demo. I record all my all my demo videos um, because it is a strong measure against the uh, trickster the, the trickster demo gods, um, who we all know are descended directly from Loki. Um, so let's uh, let's play. Um, this virtual machine is going to go up on Bone Hub. Um, you'll know that it's gone up there when you see a tweet from the In Guardians Twitter feed um, saying that a sneakers VM has been added to Volnhub. So sometime in the next, um, I'm gonna guess, you know, month or so, um, we'll put that uh, we'll put that machine up on Volnhub. So um, I just want to invite you to subscribe if you haven't already to the In Guardians Twitter feed um, and uh, and watch it for the machine download link. Okay, so I'm gonna. Pull out a full screen on these slides and go to my QuickTime player and full screen on that and uh, show you an attack on sneakers. So I've started up, um, I started up by doing an Nmap scan. And instead of having you see me type Nmap and then having us all wait for the Nmap scan to finish, I've just made that the, uh, the start of our, the start of our presentation, the start of our video. So I've gone and I've typed out Nmap. P, uh, this PN means don't don't ping the machine, or rather, don't worry about whether the machine answers to pings. Um, scan it anyway, and I really like that. Um, I've done minus O to find out what operating system um, is running, and that's going to come into that's going to come into play in our attack. Um, I'm asking for a SYN scan. We're going to do a TCP uh, TCP port scan, and for anything that answers, we're going to do a version scan against it. We're going to ask Nmap to basically and talk to the servers that answer and try to figure out what software they are and as close as it can guess to what version they are. And um, and then I'm going to say, give me all the ports. NSP hyphen thing, I get Nmap scans the top thousand ports in terms of popularity. But that means that you miss anything that isn't running on one of those top thousand ports and I won't have that. Um, and then uh, SC means I'm going to ask Nmap to run any scripts that it has. This is kind of a script scan. Um, against the ports that are discovered. So when Nmap runs, um, at the end of that run, what I see is I've got a uh, I've got port 22 um, open on SSH. Um, I've got a web server, but I've got a nice, very very old Linux kernel. And um, as an attacker, I love any machine that's so old it's probably been end of life and there are no patches available. Um, I've got an SSH port. 
um, available here. It's probably a, there's actually probably a nice um, issue with that version of OpenSSH. Um, and then I've got an Apache web server. And so we'll go look at the web servers page because that's where your the the uh, CTF authors usually put some kind of greetings page and they put their theme there and they might give you hints. Um, but also Nmap script scan has already found that there is a robots.txt file. And the robots.txt file is is there to um, is there to tell you hey, you know, it's there to tell Google's crawlers and any other web crawlers, hey, please don't please don't grab please don't crawl and cache this. Uh, we wouldn't want people to know about it or people to find it as easily or what have you. So, of course, what's the first thing as an attacker we're going to uh, What are we going to do? We're going to go and look at that. So first, let's look at the front page for sneakers. I put sneakers into my uh, Etsy host file and we find, uh, hey, welcome to sneakers. You know, this is a fairly easy one. There are three flags. Um, it's here to teach privask and we're going to add an honor rule here since we're using an old kernel. Please don't use any kernel exploits to get to root. You haven't won unless you've gotten to root without a kernel level exploit. So um, they're going to be uh, pictures that go with the flags and um, enjoy. And of course, I've put my own Twitter handle here. So here's your other one. If you're not already, um, you can come and find me, and I will uh, uh, and I will uh, uh, tweet out other things. So. Um, my video, I play like click follow. Um, so anyway, let's go to that robots. Let's go to that uh, robots.txt file. Had uh, just one file like that that we were asking not to be crawled, and it was Cosmo talks to Bishop. So Sneakers is at this point a somewhat dated movie, but it's a classic, and it's one of the movies that, as as uh, attackers, um, hackers, if you will, that we love because it's actually pretty. You know, it's actually got some pretty realistic parts in it. And um, so here we have Robert Redford and Ben Kingsley. Um, who Ben Kingsley manages to look like so many different people as he plays roles. And Robert Redford's our good guy, and guy, and the two of them are sitting on a Cray supercomputer um, in this scene. So this is just a cool little scene from the movie. Um, let's go back on the attack. So. Um, Well, I'm realizing I may have a, a video out of order, um, but uh, uh, so I've got a new Nmap scan that happens that happens later on, and that new Nmap scan has a MongoDB database in it, and this is something we should have seen on our first on our first video. So there's a MongoDB, and that's what those other two lines are. So we have port 22 for SSH and port 84 web, and we have two other ports, 27.0.17 and 28.0.17. And those are MongoDB. Now we've got MongoDB and this version, 2.2.3. This is why I love the version scan, because if I look that up, I'm going to find there's actually one of the only remote code execution exploits um, that's ever been out for MongoDB is against, well, that version. So I'm going to pull up Metasploit, where there is very nice, very nicely a Mongo. So go to, I go here, and we've got this MongoDB native helper apply remote code execution. And this exploit, the, the way it works is, uh, MongoDB actually, um, it's a NoSQL database. Um, Redis is another NoSQL database many of us have heard of. And I don't know if, if you remember, but recently in the last year or so, there was, a, there was a Redis worm. And the Redis worm came about because the author of Redis like went on, a, uh, went on one of the, uh, went on one of the big, um, I think it, it, I don't know if it was Hacker News. It was one of these. Um, it was one of these discussion forums and said, "Listen, everybody, you should not make a NoSQL database accessible to the internet. If you do, you're just asking for trouble. Let me show you what kind of trouble you're asking for." And he went and showed that you know, like, hey, you could end up getting, you could end up completely compromising um, any machine that runs Redis. Um, and of course, people very quickly turn that into you know the way they're going to compromise machines, and they automated the hell out of that. Um, and it was all because um, it was all because basically Redis could, well, you could do a few things. One of the things was that Redis could write to an arbitrary file. And another one is that um, many of these many of these databases, including Redis, have some kind of code execution, some kind of script execution. In the case of MongoDB, it executes our one of our favorite languages, which is JavaScript, unless you turn that off. So 
that's where our exploit comes in. We can actually get this thing to run to run code, and in getting it to run code, we can get it to run any code we want. So um, let's take a look at this. Uh, let's take a look at this exploit. Um, I love Metasploit as a as a teaching tool because it's the tool we all have. So I'll type info and then the path to that exploit that I got out of my search, and um, and I'll look at the and I'll look at the beginning of this, and it just kind of gives me a title for it and says that the vulnerability is closed in 2013. Um, and it works against MongoDB, just 2.2.3, they've tested 32 bits. Um, and so sneakers is a 32 bit uh, CTF VM. And, um, and this basically says you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna get code execution out of uh, Ubuntu 10 squeeze. So nice, you know, nice, very old, nine years old in the case of Ubuntu 10.04 operating system. Um, so if you find any of these around, boom, I'm gonna say I'd like to use that one. And now I'm gonna start setting the variables that you see above under basic options. I'm gonna set our hosts um, to, my, to the IP address of the sneakers machine or to its name. And I'm gonna set uh, the payload. And if I hit Linux and hit tab, it says x86, because it knows only 32 bit things will work with this. And so I've chosen a interpreter reverse shell that's gonna connect back to me show options and see, okay, what else am I gonna fill in? If you've ever played with Metasploit, you know that the command you use most of all out of all of them is not exploit or show options. You're constantly entering in fields and then hitting show options to see what else you, what else you can fill in. So um, I need to set my uh, port um, that I want the, that I exploit, um, when the exploit triggers the uh, interpreter, Interpreter is going to connect back to me for some command and control or C2. So I need to I need to choose a port, and I'll choose. I've left HD Moore's first favorite port 4444. I'm going to choose uh, three nines, and now I'm going to set and uh, I'm going to set an output. Um, that's the IP address I want this exploit the this exploit's interpreter to connect back to, and I'm going to use set G, which lets me globally set this so. That it, every everything I run out of Metasploit will say connect back to this host um, instead of having to set the set that L host on everything. And I type exploit, and it says, "Hey, this could take some time," and it finishes pretty darn quickly. And here we go. Um, it says you've got a interpreter shell, and I say, "Okay, well, what UID am I, do I have on that system?" And I'm hoping for zero. I'm hoping for zero because that's rude, or maybe for a system user, what I got back was 1003, which will definitely be a, a, a normal human user. Um, that's not so bad, but I would have liked root. So now I'll type shell and see what directory I'm in. It says you're in the root directory. Okay, so now I'll type ID and it says the user is a reference to the movie, Sea Tech Astronomy. Um, I'm gonna going to offer to ruin this part of the movie. If you haven't seen Sneakers yet, go see it, and, uh, um, and I will try not to ruin the movie too much for you, but Sea Tech Astronomy is, a, is an anagram um, for too many secrets. Um, so, um, so now I'm going to type bash minus i, and I'm doing that just to get an interactive bash shell, something, an environment that, that's a little bit nicer. Um, and I get a warning. There's no job control in the shell because this isn't really much of a shell. This is a this is an interpreter running Bash. Um, and now I'm going to switch into CTech Astronomy's home directory by typing CD. And now I'll look around. And if I look around, I see this must be where Mongo where MongoDB is running out of because I see all the files for Mongo here, and I also see a flag file. So let's look at that flag file. The flag file says, hey, welcome to SeaTech Astronomy, or maybe we're Playtronics, which is the, uh, the toy company that the bad guy, you know, um, has, his, has his office building posing as. Um, and uh, we, get a, we get a little, we get a little uh, graphic we can go. Um, and this is the line that goes with the graphic is toy company, my ass. And, uh, and then we have a hint. And our hint says, if we're going to sneak in the building, we probably want to impersonate Warner Brandis. So let's go click our toy company link. So that of a shell, so I'm just doing copy paste. And this is supposed to be a toy company with all the, uh, with all the uh, uh, high, with all the high, and I don't remember whether 
uh, fencing. So a little high security, um, and Robert Redford doesn't believe this to just be a toy company. So let's go and now let's go and take a look around. Now this is a point where I have, um, as I often do in these for purposes of time, I've kind of I've kind of skipped a lot of the flailing around that we do as attackers, trying to figure out how we're going to escalate privilege. As an attacker, um, it isn't just like you see in the movies with all the whiz bang lights, but it's all, but but most importantly, it's not as fast as you see in the movies. Um, most of the time, most of what we're doing requires a certain amount of looking around and basically trying to find a weakness. We're either trying to find something that's weak because it was a default setting, or we're trying to find something that's weak because um, there was a, a code of only body like we had in MongoDB, or we're trying to find a weakness because someone has, to make something work, um, has gone and you know changed the permissions on something and just made it, said, I can't make this work, so I'm just going to make the file world, you know, readable, writable, and executable um, by, you know, every user on the system is allowed to, is allowed to, uh, um, is allowed to do anything they want to this file. And that doesn't sound too dangerous if this is a web server, right? This is just a web server with its own database back in the web application. And it doesn't seem all that and say, yeah, uh, I'm sure, every user on the box, the box has like one administrator and then it has a, uh, and then as a web server, uh, sure, everything should be able to read any file um, that trusted users. The problem is that we just got access as, uh, as the MongoDB database, which probably doesn't need to be able to read users' home directories or, as we'll see, uh, users' crontab files. So after a while of flailing around and looking around, you have to imagine, as an attacker, we found, uh, we found that we looked at the crontab files. Um, and after this uh, webinar is over, I have to, um, I'm going to find that I have to uh, take a, uh, one of my favorite scenarios out of uh, my set of questions for in Guardian's interviews. Uh, because when we're interviewing people, we basically ask them, you know, like we kind of talk them through a scenario and ask them to think of uh, how they might escalate privilege on a system. And this is, this is actually strongly related to one of my favorites. Um, so we can, uh, as the as this uh, database user, we're going to go and look at the crontab files, and we'll look at a crontab file for Warner Brandis. Imagine that we had to find that account, and you know, and, and uh, all that. But um, and we see that his crontab file every minute um, runs this script called Authenticate to Door. So, huh? Let's take a look at that script. So first, let's look at its permissions. And I gave you a hint that this was coming, some foreshadowing. But this thing's been marked. This one, this thing's been marked. You know, Shamad 777. It's been set to world writable, world readable, world executable. And um, let's look at what this script does. It's always strange seeing yourself type. So we cut out the script, and uh, and it says, ah, this script is kind of just a, a little bit of a dummy script. But it says a fa one of my one of my favorite lines from the movie. It says, my voice is my passport. Verify me. And that's the that's what the line that Warner Brandis says to get into his office. And so um, to uh, our Robert Redford and his friends uh, break into that office by recording each of those words. Um, said by Warner Brandis by uh, sending someone on a date with him um, and trying to get him to say uh, each of these words. He, he does find it a little strange that someone's trying to get him to say passport. Um, but my voice is my passport. Verify me. So um, the thing is, this script was uh, world writable. So we could basically, if this thing's going to run once a minute, Warner Brandis' uh, user ID with his user context, we can get his user context by putting something in here. And so we're going to stop. We're going to pause here, um, and we're going to background. So I hit Control Z to background the, this one uh, this one session inside my interpreter. Um, and uh, and now I'm going to I'm going to uh, tell the interpreter, please, interpreter running on that system, switch to the temp directory. And I want to upload my own little reverse shell. So I'm going to upload a reverse shell. And this reverse shell is just one of the reverse shells that's in user share 
uh, web shells in every copy of Kali Linux, and all I've had to do is change an IP address. So this is a quick little Python reverse shell. You don't even have to write it yourself. You can just go and get it out of user share web shells, and all you've got to do is set the IP address and the port you want the reverse shell to connect back to. If Python is on the system, then this reverse shell can run, and it'll start up a shell. So this is the file we just uploaded into temp. And now we'll go back to our interpreter. And I'm using channel list to list the channels. There was just one channel, it's channel one, and that's the one where my shell is running. And I'm gonna go back and basically uh, interact with that channel again. And here I am, if I hit enter, I can see that, yep, I'm in that channel. And let's take a look at temp reverse shell. Make sure it made it there. Yep, it's made it there just fine. So now, before I run it, I'm going to set up a net, or before I wait, while I wait for it to run, because Cron, Cron's going to run it, I set up a little net hat listener um, in a separate tab on my Cali box. And now I'm just waiting for this thing to, uh, waiting for this thing to run. Oh wait, I've uploaded the reverse. I've uploaded the reverse shell. I have to. I, I've got some. I've got a neck listener waiting for it. I'm gonna put my. Uh, I'm gonna put my Python. Uh, I'm gonna put a, a Python line to run that reverse shell into the script that Warner Brandis's cron uh, cron tab is running. And so now, if I wait a full minute, and I've basically fast forwarded through that part, but if I wait a full minute, um, this is what happens. That Python program runs. Uh, so Warner Brandis' cron tab file says run this Python program every one minute. The cool thing is about it running every one minute is we get what, atta what we attackers call persistence. Like we got access to that first exploit. The downside is that if that session fell down, we have to re-exploit the machine, and that's another chance to get caught. It's also sometimes the case that like our exploit kills off the thing we're exploiting, and so it's not there to use a second time. So we have to get persistence as fast as we can. So this is getting us two things. One is it's switching our user um, from the uh, from the user that was running MongoDB over to which is Ctech Astronomy over to Warner Brandis, and the other is that it's getting us that guarantee that if we lose our connection within 60 seconds we're going to get a new one so here we are we're user Werner Brandis let's do a list and there's flag.txt as a message in here Werner I need you to take care of a few things since you have the adjacent office to me here at Play Playtronics and this is from Cosmo the big bad guy and uh, this is what's written here is the reference to the movie where, where we had to worry about the office temperature um, because we're going to be sneaking past it. We're going to change its temperature so we could, we could uh, not get detected by the motion sensors. It says, hey, make sure it's cool at night. You can SSH in as me. Remember, my password is our corporate motto here, followed by voice passport. So the corporate motto here would be, would be uh, no more secrets. Um, or too many secrets. So no more secrets is the uh, is the one that's uh, important to us. And so after lots of guessing, that's what we, that's what you might come up with. Or after well, two guesses basically. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to SSH in as Cosmo with that voice passport. Um, and while we're at it, let's take a look at Warner Brandis just so we all kind of remember the movie a little bit because this is part of our flag. And there's Warner Brandis an actor that you've probably seen play all kinds of roles. I loved him as, uh, as a, the guy who had the Midas Golden Touch in the TV show Heroes. Okay, so we'll SSH in as Cosmo. And I'm gonna use a separate terminal for this. So I don't have to rely on that first connection. Could have done it from the system I was already from where I was already in. Um, so I do my no more secrets voice passport, and I've got this next line. It says, Marty, I can only hope it's you. I've lured you here to trap you. 
Maybe you'll enjoy my restricted shell jail. <laughs> um, and this restricted shell jail is Arbash. Um, so if you ever wondered how you get out of Arbash, uh, here's a, uh, it's, it's not too hard. The trick with Arbash, what does it do? Arbash makes it so that your, so that if you, if you give a user an Arbash shell, they're only allowed to run programs that are in their path. So you generally give them a path um, that doesn't include any programs that you don't want them to have access to. You give them some kind of restricted path. On this one, um, the CTF author, who's also the person making the presentation at the moment, right, um, has gone and said, ah, I'm not going to actually make it a whitelist of commands. I'm going to make it so that you can run any normal command, but I'm going to take sudo and move it um, and move it to a directory that's not in your path. And if you try to run something like password, it says, "Hey, you can't you can't uh, you can't run this because you have to have you can't have slash in your command names. You can't specify the path." So I'm not going to be able to run sudo. And there's a nice little path. There's a nice little way past this. Um, uh, so let's uh, let's take a look at how I might get around it. I hope I hope some of you uh, some of you are already guessing ways around it. Um, Here's a, uh, oh, before we get around it, let's look at our flag. Oh, we can't look at our flag. Why can't we look at our flag? Oh, it's root owned. That's the final flag. It's the one we only get if we, if we get root privilege. So cool. Well, let's use VI. What do you, what should we use VI for? Oh, for one of a whole bunch of ways to escape one of these uh, restricted bash shells. Um, all I need to escape is basically to run a program that will run another shell for me that isn't restricted. So VI, I don't know why they thought this was a good idea. I think it might be so you could like run, so you could edit code with VI, and then without leaving VI, you could go and compile that code and test it out. So if you hit, if you hit colon and then exclamation point and type a program out, you can run it. So I'm going to type out SH. And here I am. I know it doesn't look like much. But I'm now in a I'm now in a non-restricted shell, and what I'll do now is go looking for sudo. So let's use find. I could be using slocate, but let's do find on sudo, and I get a long list. I didn't redirect the uh, the standard error, so I'm gonna have to page through this uh, muck, as I like to think of it. All these permission denied, the things that my user wasn't allowed to go into. Um, and I find the very first line of the output that wasn't standard error was telling me that I can find sudo in slash opt. So let's run slash opt sudo. And minus L tells me what this user is allowed to do. So basically lists this user's part of the sudoers file. And what this says is, hey, Cosmo is allowed to run every command on the host as, as root without a password. Oh, well, that will do nicely. So opt sudo, su minus, and boom, we're root. By the way, a bunch of you, I just found out recently, a lot of people do type sudo and then su and don't put a minus on it. And then they have to switch into the home, then they switch into the home directory to use they turned into. That minus, that hyphen after su is really important um, because it makes it so that you, makes it so it's really like you logged in as that user. You get that user's normal environment variables, you get the, the all the uh, you get basically your environment set up the way that user would have it, and it makes a whole bunch of things easier, and it makes some it makes some things work that wouldn't have worked. So, so anyway, that's basically our attack path. Let's look at our last flag. Hey, where's my flag? Oh, we need to be in Cosmos directory. That's where that root flag was, and it says you win. Now go watch sneakers. And this is the scene of the movie where Cosmo, our bad guy, realizes that he's been tricked by the good guy. And so let's pop that up real quick. Ah, it's a wonderful look on his face. Man, it was hard to get that screenshot. So, um, so that's the uh, that's the end of our attack path. And what I'm going to do now is um, talk through how we would break this. So. Um, so let's review what the attack path was here. So first, we nmapped the virtual machine. We found the exposed MongoDB server. We also got to find that robots.txt file, uh, a Metasploit exploit that got us remote co-execution via a, uh, a MongoDB vulnerability 
that's only present in a specific version of MongoDB or it was only tested in a specific version of MongoDB with 32-bit um, that was compiled 32-bit. We gained the first flag in SeaTac Astronomy's home directory and then we found a world writable script in Warner Brandis's CronTab file, which gave us a path to get to Warner Brandis by adding a reverse shell to Warner Brandis's um, world writable authenticated door script that my voice is my passport verify me thing. Um, we gained persistence via that netcat listener um, that gets a uh, that gets a reverse shell once a minute. Um, we acquired a new flag and our password hint, which was the motto plus voice passport. So um, we SSH'd into the machine as user Cosmo, and we found ourselves in that RBAS restricted shell, um, and we couldn't run anything. Uh, we couldn't run anything that's not in our path. Um, and then we used VI to escape that restricted shell. Now there are a bunch of programs we could have used. Like if TCP dump had been available, that thing will run programs. Tar will run programs. Find will run programs. There are a tremendous number of Unix utilities you can use to escape from restricted shells. So don't worry if you don't see VI. Find anything that can run commands. Uh, yes, that means reading, reading man pages. Um, and um, it's pretty freaking cool. So then we located sudo in slash opt, and we ran it to gain root. So that's our, that's our attack path. So I'm going to show you how we, how we can break that attack path by basically um, giving MongoDB a better configuration. And the trick here is we're going to give MongoDB a, a configuration that matches what the actual need was. And that's all that hardening really is often. Sometimes hardening is some, is some neat tricks, but sometimes hardening is just, if you look at the CIS benchmarks or, or any books or articles on hardening, most of the time all we're doing is saying, okay, this program lets us, this program has things that we can turn on and turn off or things that we can restrict to some of the users but not others or or places where we can add authentication. Uh, why don't you just do that? As long as it doesn't break your application, um, then all you've done is taken away possibilities from your attacker while keeping all of your own, while keeping all the necessary um, capability intact. So, um, so that's basically what we're going to do. We're conf going to configure MongoDB differently. And I'm going to try um, switching to my defense script. So, oh. And the first thing we'll do is just move opt sudo back to its normal position so that if we have to SSH in as Cosmo again, even if Cosmo's got the restricted shell, we can just sudo sue out of it. So I'll take that away. And now I'll edit um, the start script, the, the, uh, the, the script that's running MongoDB. And the reason I'm editing is because I can do what I'm trying to do just with a command line option. I'm going to edit MongoDB, and it looks like it says MongoDB.conf, but this was this start script is an upstart start script. This is what Ubuntu used for years um, before switching to systemd like everybody else did, or like almost everybody else did. So I'm going to MongoDB, and I find this script that starts up, um, that's starting up MongoDB, and a lot of people run MongoDB as root. I've got it set up so that it's running into CTEC Astronomy in here. Um, and what I'll add here is hyphen hyphen no scripting. And what the hyphen hyphen no scripting will do is just make it so the JavaScript doesn't run, which breaks our exploit. Um, also, since this was using op sudo, I'll change the path for sudo. So I edit that file. I'm going to start and stop MongoDB. Actually, I did this a couple times. Um, and exploit, and now the exploit runs, but it doesn't actually work. It does the thing, does the first step it had to do. It creates a new document in a, in a, in a collection. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. That's just some MongoDB functionality. But, um, it isn't able to get code execution out of doing that. And that's the, uh, and that's the win for us. So our exploit's broken. Now we can go a little bit further. Um, if you look at the Redis, if you look at the big at the big Redis article I was talking to you about before, where the Redis authors like, listen, NoSQL databases really shouldn't be accessible to, uh, out on the internet. They need to be accessible only to the application. Otherwise, you know, the box is getting taken over. And uh, and then he was surprised when his explanation turned into a uh, into a basically into a worm. 
um, so multiple worms. One of them was called Redis wanamine, and it was something. It was a, a worm that used um, that used the Redis vulnerability to want to cry, and in both cases, it installed cryptocurrency. It installed, installed cryptocurrency mining. Um, so what we're going to do um, is do one other is do one other change to the MongoDB configuration file. So in addition to that no scripting, we can also say, listen, just listen on localhost. Let's assume that the application um, that needs to use MongoDB can be running on the same system. If it can, we're good, um, and uh, uh, we're good, and our attacker doesn't get to reach it in the first place. So I'll restart MongoDB, and I run my netstat command. And MongoDB, unfortunately, is still listening. So I had to do this a second time. And this is really important. This is something I really like um, to be able to show you. Um, sometimes you, sometimes you, whenever you make a change that's going to harden a system or it's going to patch something, you have to go and make sure that the change that you made actually took effect. Because the fact that it should have taken effect or it would have taken effect if everything went right, doesn't mean it did. And so it's really important to go back and basically check for that. So when I went and checked for that, I found that it hadn't, so I had to stop and start it again. And now when I run NetSat, it's listing on just localhost. And that's uh, and that's gonna make it, you know, the first thing, the first way we defended made it so that we could still reach MongoDB across the internet, and um, but our exploit broke. The second way is going to break any other exploits that didn't need scripting turned on. So if I were to end map this, uh, if I were to end map this box now, same kind of thing, sin scan, version scan. Don't worry about pinging at first. What I find is, ah, there we go. Open SSH on port 22, Apache on port 80, and MongoDB, while still running, isn't uh, isn't available to us. So that's our. Uh, that's our defense. It's um, the thing you should get is the thing that's really important here to get is it was pretty darn straightforward um, because we said, does our application actually need MongoDB to run JavaScript for us? If it doesn't, then let's just turn that off. Um, and then we went a little further and said, wait, if we don't have to, if our application can run on the same system and doesn't need um, and doesn't need MongoDB to be accessible. Um, from outside the from outside the box, we're good. Some of you are thinking like, wait, there are going to be plenty of times where Mongo, where you know, I have I have the database server on one machine and the another, and that's okay. But this is a place where that's a place where people still still get to have the same kind of benefit if they can create an encrypted tunnel or tunnel of any sort. But we love encrypted um, between the two systems, and you know, people have been doing it for a very very long time. It's kind of one of the big one of the big use cases for S tunnel. Um, or stunnel, as some people like to call it. So um, there are other things we could have done to break the to to break um, the attack here. Remember, once I got access with Mongo with uh, that vulnerable MongoDB, um, I went and found a uh, I went and found a world writable file. Um, and those world writable files, you know, this is one of the things. If you if you put me in a Linux system and say, okay, you are user J, find a path to root. Um, often what I'm going to do is go looking for world writable files and I'm going to look in that list for anything that's world writable that isn't ordinarily world writable. Um, Some place where a developer or an admin accidentally or just temporarily and then forgot to reverse it, you know, went and made it, made, fi made some file on the system writable by everybody. I'll also go and say what users do I have and go see what files are writable by those, or not what users, what groups user because I'll have a bunch and I'll find what files are writable by those groups even if they're not world writable. Um, so I like that. Even further, another step is I can basically look at the permissions um, of anything that's run by cron. Sure that those things that are run by cron aren't writable by anybody well ideally other than root or the user whose cron tab um, whose cron tab I'm looking at. Um, so that's my um, that's uh, that's another that's another one of those kinds of proactive defenses. Um, the other, uh, just to head off a potential question, I can imagine someone saying, "Well, you just told us, you know, our bash was was a you know kind of a uh, I was 
I, I was uh, about to use a <laughs> an, an opportune phrase that our bash really wasn't worth um, really wasn't uh, worth much as a defensive measure for user like that using that restricted shell. Um, what do you what would you suggest? And um, and what I'd say here is if you did have a user that you like want to you know want to um, lock up and you know keep you know give give a, give an ability to run things on the system but not to do not to have a full run of the system. There are a couple. There are a couple kinds of technologies I'd consider. So one is um, you could use things like SE Linux or AppArmor. You could use the the Linux security module um, type stuff to give them a shell that is that is better constrained. That's constrained by the kernel to execute things on a whitelist, and that would be good. You could also go a step further, and um, and that is you know you could basically have a container. Um, I don't have, you know, I have to call a Docker container. I can call it a Linux container because I don't have to have Docker on the system to do this. I can do it with system D or what have you, but I could have a container. Everything they need to do, I can lock them in that, you know, I can lock that capability in the container. Now, some of you are saying, wait, containers aren't as strong as VMs. And I'm, and, and to that, to that, I'd say that's true. VMs are definitely, definitely much better, much more of a security boundary than containers are at this point. Um, and that's just, that's just fine. That that's true. But but the point of the question is to make this user on this system be able to do their things. Now, if I do, I guess I, I could actually use the hypervisor built into Linux kernel, but that's I'm starting to really get ahead of myself at that point. So if uh if this is on your mind and you want me to keep going with that, uh, post that question in. Okay, well that's uh that's what I have to say, and I wanna open us up for QA. I'm not sure we have any questions. Um, either that, or I'm not sure that my audio is working. Um, yeah, audio is working just fine. Uh, we don't have any questions uh, right now. Uh, we had a question early on on whether or not the slides would be available. I mentioned that these recordings are available under the GoToWebinar uh, site uh, for uh, a couple of months, uh, and then we transfer them over to our YouTube channel. Thanks. Cool. Well, then I'd like to I'd like to say goodbye. I'd like to do all my presentations. I let you know that InGuardians has this great um, weekly executive briefing. Um, you can sign up for it, and you get one email from us once a week. It's uh, we'll never spam you. We're what we'll do is basically take some one thing that's, ha that's happened in information security news in the last week, and we'll write a little bit about it and give you our advice on what you can do to to handle it, prepare for it. Um, look for it, um, deal with it, et cetera. Um, and you'll also find in there that we'll tell you about uh, any future events, speaking, visiting cities, um, or trainings, or what have you that we do. So um, I'd urge you to, to join the many, many people who've signed up for this weekly briefing. Um, it's uh, it's always good. I, I read every one. Um, well, thank uh, and, you very uh, much. And Jay, also, we, we also have... Uh, Next month's uh, webinar uh, from uh, uh, our CEO, Jimmy Alderson, uh, will be uh, uh, joining us uh, last Thursday of the month. Uh, check it out at uh, inguardians.com slash webinars. Uh, and uh, it's going to be about uh, incident response primer for executives. Uh, should be lots of fun there. We did have a couple questions here. Uh, we, we've got a question from uh, Tim here on the difference between pseudo-i uh, and pseudo SU dash. Wow, you you uh, I think you might have me on that one. Sudo so dash i versus sudo su dash. So what I'm going to say first of all is, as an attacker, I love sudo su sudo dash i. Um, but as a defender, um, I don't ever want anybody to sudo su. Um, I don't want anyone. Um, I don't want ever anyone to use sudo to just become the root user. The better practice is that I use sudo and I either 
if um, I either make it so that some so that the people on my system that are running sudo are only allowed to do things from a whitelist, from a set of allow list, a set of a set of things that I that I know that they need to do. Or um, alternatively, if I do want them to have that kind of you know the ability to run every command, I still tell them because we use this as an audit trail. We use this as a way of basically of knowing who did what on the system. And people might say, like, I don't want you spying on me. If you're going to be doing administrative actions, wouldn't you want us to be able to say that you weren't the one that broke the system when something breaks? And the way we do that, you know, the way we do that as defenders um, or as, is, to, uh, is to use sudo more responsibly. Um, so that's, uh, you know, for me, that's the, that's the real key. Um, as an attacker, uh, it's a good question. I think if I um, uh, if I want to know the answer to that, I'd probably take take a look at the at the uh, man page. And I'd love to uh, I'd love to pull that up right now, but I don't know what's running in my terminal at the moment and whether it's private. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say that what we should do is pitch and and see what we think. All right. Well, thank you so much. Well, folks, if there's uh, no uh, other questions, uh, we appreciate you joining us uh, for uh, this great uh, webinar uh, from Jay. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you uh, again uh, next month uh, for Incident Response uh, for Executives. Uh, now, uh, it'd be great if uh, we got a bunch of executives to join, uh, but uh, you don't have to be an executive to join that briefing. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way for you to get a, a handle on what your executives need to know about Incident Response. So. Uh, looking forward to seeing everybody there. Uh, have a great day.